Hey everybody, I'm Hugh Brownstone for Three Blind Men and an Elephant. And today I'm delighted to have with me Brendan Schulman. Brendan, nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. Thanks for taking the time. Uh, and you are Vice President of... Policy and Legal Affairs. At DJI. At DJI. So we're at a DJI event in New York City at the famous Bathhouse Studios on the Lower East Side. But we're not going to talk about that history today, Brendan, we could. But instead, let's talk about the history and current state of regulation of the drone industry. It was only uh, uh, this past summer that Part 107 came into being, and before that there was a 333 exemption. So can you just take us through the evolution of the regulation of this fascinating, fascinating technology. Sure, be happy to. So um, really this is the culmination of a 10-year process that the FAA has worked on to try to get a set of basic operating rules for civilian unmanned aircraft systems. Hang drones. on, hold that thought. A 10-year process? Is DJI even 10 years old? Uh, we are exactly 10 years old this year actually. Wow, so how is it that the government was working on this even 10 years ago? What was the impetus for that? I, 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 well, the impetus or the expectation was that you'd have unmanned aircraft systems, drones, like the kind the military was using overseas, used for civilian and commercial operations in the United States, maybe border patrol, forestry, firefighting. And so for a long time, the, the FAA struggled with how to take a pilotless plane and integrate it into the existing air traffic control system. That's actually a pretty complicated uh, type of thing to do. Um, what happened over that decade is you got these smaller platforms that are very capable, very easy to fly, um, emerging as very popular and used for all manner of commercial operations uh, worldwide. And so the, I think the rulemaking process shifted from trying to take these larger platforms, high altitude, to trying to deal with the small unmanned aircraft systems that people were using more often. And in 2012, Congress directed the FAA to, um, to really focus and get the rulemaking done for the small unmanned aircraft category, which is under 55 pounds. So you joined DJI just about a year ago, yep, right? Yeah, a year and a half. And before that, you were a lawyer in private practice right. in the drone space. <laughs> yeah, uh, it, that's right. Um, so I was in private practice at a New York law firm called Kramer Levin, uh, where I started the very first unmanned aircraft systems or drone legal practice group. Had some of the landmark cases in the industry, including um, issues about what the FAA does or doesn't regulate at that time, before Part 107 was out, um, as well as proposing different kinds of solutions for the rulemaking process and advocating for humanitarian, nonprofit use of, of drones, including for search and rescue operations, as well as just trying to get a framework in place that would make sense so that people could go out and use the equipment in productive ways. Now, I'm fascinated. I always say, yeah, it's about the gear, but no, it's not about the gear, it's about the people, and you're the people today. So, how did you get involved in this? Were you a, a radio control flyer enthusiast, or did you just see an opportunity to carve a new practice for yourself? Or? You, you guessed right the first time. So, okay. so I, uh, for over 20 years, I've been building and flying model airplanes, and that's where my long interest in the technology has been, especially uh, in the past few years, or really the past five or so years, when we moved from just flying around for fun to aerial photography and, and automation and advanced programming. Um, so as that interest developed, there was this great intersection of the technology and my interest in it with my legal interests in technology-related subject, um, which is something I've been doing as a private practice matter for, you know, at that point, about 12 or 13 years. So when the first cases came along concerning the use of drones for civilian purposes, I was extremely interested in working on them and sort of seized that opportunity and um, here, we are. <laughs> here I am. Right? It's, it's so interesting to me. It's such a hot topic for so many reasons and we touched on this briefly before we sat down in front of the camera, but the, the intersection of this kind of capability with things like privacy uh, they blow my mind, actually. So let's talk a little bit about that. Uh, where is the boundary between the, the notion of privacy and, let's say, the public good? This is one of the leading policy 
questions that you, that you see out there, and you often see those privacy concerns translated into state and local legislation. Uh, last year, just as an example, we saw almost 300 state bills concerning drones, um, some of which attempted to address privacy concerns. Uh, I think, personally, for the most part, there are existing privacy laws that already govern expectations of privacy and criminal and civil penalties for invasions of privacy. So, for example, we're here in New York State. There is an unlawful surveillance statute. It's been on the books for a long time. It balances freedom of, of news gathering, First Amendment, um, public space concerns, or interests, I should say, with concerns about privacy and, and what you can expect to be you know, where you can expect to not be photographed, for example. So that exists on the books today, and there was already a prosecution, I would say about a year or two ago, of someone who was flying a drone near a medical facility and was alleged to have been spying on people inside the building who were disrobed for their medical examinations. Aye, Went all aye. the way through trial, the jury acquitted on the basis that, not, not because the law wasn't applicable, but because the, the building in question had mirrored glass and there was no way he could have been looking in, even if he'd wanted to, to spy on people. So on the facts he was acquitted, but had he actually been spying uh, and, and invading the reasonable expectation of privacy under New York law, he would have been uh, convicted and, and would be serving a penalty right now for that crime. So we already have existing privacy laws. I think they're pretty good. There may be marginal issues. I often hear Persistent surveillance is a concern, even though the batteries last for 20 to 30 minutes. Um, I are, know. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure you know. I know. I'm sure, I'm sure everyone out there knows as well. You know, that's something we, we try to get that time up so people can be more useful with their flights. But, uh, you know, realistically, no one is doing persistent surveillance with drones today. But that is a concern that I hear often and, and could develop into you know, an area where we need additional legislation. I think technology neutral. I think that the problem of persistent surveillance is not a drone issue, it's a surveillance issue. So let's address the concerns without just calling out the drone specifically. I, I like that very much. Uh, it's, it's clear that the way to uh, persistent surveillance would be solar power, and that's coming. Uh, although it seems it's going to be a while before you have enough surface area on something like the Inspire 2 to stay aloft for, for days on end. Uh, but of course, privacy is not the only issue. And uh, I want to tread lightly on this, but there are other issues like taking something that those of us who will be watching this uh, might, might be concerned about, which is you take something which is fun uh, or is a photographic tool, an artistic tool, a documentary uh, tool, and then you have, again, these notions of where does privacy versus the public good hit a wall? Uh, so, for example, in Standing Rock, you had uh, civilian drone pilots wanting to fly over, and they were actually shot at, and in one case, they were brought down. Now, without getting into who's the good guy and who's the bad guy here, uh, do you have a perspective on uh, defenses uh, not from a technical perspective, but from a legal perspective, which would allow a drone operator to say, you can't do that. Um, there are a couple things going on. It's actually a really interesting question. Number one, we have a statute, Title 18, prohibits anyone from destroying or damaging an aircraft. And the, these are considered aircraft under federal law. In fact, there was a lot of work that I did in my early years uh, in this field that, that concerned the question of whether these are aircraft or something else. And it was decided, really by Congress, these are aircraft. So then the question is, all right, do we have a statute that already prohibits that? And, and if so, does that need to be changed or not? I think the underlying issues are sort of ones we can already um, understand. There, there will be a news gathering interest in places where there are conflict of any kind. And um, you know, we know that um, there are news gathering organizations and individuals who are interested in, in recording things from the air. And, and there's a First Amendment protection for that. I think that needs to be respected. At the same time, there's certainly uh, a safety and security issue for any kind of um, law enforcement agency at the scene of something that's going on. So, you know, what we've seen is um, a couple ways to address that is in some places there have been temporary flight restrictions issued by the FAA. Um, also perhaps controversial, but um, Again, that's the FAA making the, the judgment call saying that it's not safe to fly an aircraft in those locations. If there's a safety issue, uh, I'm sympathetic to, to trying to keep airspace safe. If there are other flights of manned aircraft in the area, 
uh, we need a balancing of those interests. But I, I, I think this, the issue you're raising is really an interesting one that we will continue to discuss. One way to deal with it is best practices. The, the News Media Coalition, a um, group of companies interested in using drones for news gathering, have best practices. And, and, and they sort of follow from things like the police tape. You know, you don't cross the line. Is there a way not to cross the line when you're in the air with a drone? Maybe there is, uh, so that you can balance the First Amendment uh, interests with the safety and security concerns. Interesting. I like that. There is a, a, another side to that, uh, which is not defense, but offense. And again, we talked about this briefly. I don't want to make it a big part of what we do, but still, North Dakota last year, uh, site of Standing Rock, also the site of the first legislation to uh, authorize weaponization of drones. Do you have a perspective on that? You know, we're, we're really focused on the, the, the hundreds of amazing applications um, that, are, that don't really raise controversy, things like helping whales, agriculture, cinematography, uh, search and rescue. Um, I, you know, I think, you know, we're not aware of customers who tried to weaponize our drones. We don't support that. We think the drones are used for good and for non-controversial purposes everywhere, including for recreation and, and education. We, lots of um, students who are learning about robotics and aviation and programming using our products. So I think the, the, you know, the question of can you arm a drone, who gets to do that, is really more in the field of, of weapons and, and firearms discussions and policy rather than drone policy. So it's really not an issue that I personally have had to deal with uh, much. You know, I, I, you know, the few times it's come up, I, I think, you know, my perspective is we don't really want to see drones weaponized. That's not why we design them and build them and try to advance the technology. We want them used in other applications. And then, you know, to the extent someone has concerns or wants to engage on that, there are plenty of uh, people to talk to in the law enforcement community, national security, um, and, and others to, to try to figure out what the right balance is on something like that. Well, uh, I'm perfectly comfortable with uh, the label of nerd and geek on myself. I don't know if you feel comfortable. Yeah, of course. But, but so as one geek to another, I have to agree with you. Uh, taking a, a, a drone, quadcopter, and guiding it out over open water to catch a beautiful shot is thrilling. And, uh, and this kind of technology allows me to do that. Well, look, uh, I'm glad to make this first conversation. I know we have barely scratched the surface of, of regulation, uh, but I'm also aware of the 30-minute time limit on the Sony A6300. Uh, so, Brendan, it's a real pleasure to meet you, and I hope this is just the beginning of a much longer conversation. Uh, by the way, okay, here we go. What are we looking at over here? Oh, this is the Inspire 2. It's uh, the, uh, the big upgrade to the original Inspire. Uh, and, and it's really an amazing machine. It has two batteries for redundancy and extended flight time, uh, better cameras. It's got, you know, with respect to safety and, and security features, it has the, um, the collision avoidance with the two extra cameras on the front uh, and the separate first-person view camera to assist in your, in your aerial capture of imagery. So it's, it's a really, I think it's an amazing machine, actually. The thing that's interesting to me about it is I'm looking at that uh, micro four-thirds interchangeable lens mount and the uh, lens that's on it. That really, in theory, can give one tremendous latitude in image capture. But uh, I asked the question earlier. You couldn't answer it. It's fine. I understand. No problem. Uh, but that is, how big can these lenses go? Because unless you can zoom in, uh, not digitally, uh, then there's not really an advantage other than that it's a much better sensor than the one that comes in on, let's say, the Phantom uh, 4 Pro now. Right. So, I, I, look, I think if you're interested in, in, in zooming in, there's uh, really an industrial camera we sell, the Z30, um, that has a tremendous zoom capabilities. You would want to mount that to our M600 or M100 platforms, the sort of more industrial style systems and then you could do um, we have people doing wind turbine inspection from like half a mile away Amazing well stuff. okay I was gonna end it and I'd already shaken your hand and was gonna cut and say I'm three blind men and elephant but I do have a, a strategic business question for you I don't know I if you probably you're the won't one. answer that but okay. Okay. Ask, it, okay. ask it anyway uh, fair <laughs> enough uh, what proportion of your business today is consumer versus uh, industrial so I, I won't give you a business strategic, strategic answer. I'll give you a personal well, that's observation. that's completely fair. As someone who, who's just observed the industry for a number of years, I, I, it's probably something like 
And I'm saying that because I, which one is 80? 80? 80s consumer, okay. or pers what I would call personal use people, just just out there doing the sun sunset photography for their own enjoyment, and then 20 percent people are actually trying to sell something or do something in connection with the business. Um, just a personal observation, not based on market studies or anything like that. And, and I think now that we have part one of seven, which is a low barrier to entry, you go and you take your test, costs $150, 91% of and people- And you've been very active in, in making that happen. Yeah, yeah, I, we work often with the FAA on, on making the rules reasonable. So what, part one of seven is a great set of initial rules. So you, you take your test, it's a written multiple choice test, 91% of the people who take it pass costs $150 and then you're licensed to go and do commercial operations. And, and by the way, as we discussed before this, this interview, that will become a basic criterion to do business. Uh, people will be asking for it. Yeah. It makes perfect sense. Yeah, and I, I'm, I'm very pleased that it, it, it's easy to get it. Uh, it actually, the exam teaches you things you probably should know anyway about how airspace works and what to do about airports. You know, there's probably a couple of topics on there that you don't need to know much about. Uh, but they test you on anyway. But for the most part, they're teaching you things that I think you'll find helpful. Um, and, and it's a reasonable barrier to entry, which was my concern a couple years ago about where this stuff With was three, going. three, three. Right. Yeah. That was not reasonable. Yeah, so, I agree. So we're, we're in a much better place. And I think, you know, vis-a-vis -vis your original question, if it's 80-20 now, I, I think we see the commercial side growing a lot because we now have a great set of rules. Yeah. Well, again, Brendan, thank you oh, once again. For Three Blind Men and an Elephant, I'm Hugh Brownstone. See you next time.